Hello, how lovely you're here. My name is Eva from Eva Gems and Jewels and welcome to the Gem Tales part two on the Screaming Red Ruby. Now today I'd like to talk to you about who is this great ruby imposter throughout history that you've probably never heard of and also eight other ruby misnomers you really need to know. Please also don't forget to follow or like this video. I'd really be grateful and appreciate it. Now, the goal of this video is firstly to share some fun facts with you on color gemstones, but also to answer any questions you may have on gemstones or on the ruby in particular today. You can leave any questions you may have in the comments below and I'll get back to you or shoot another video on it and also to help you understand a little bit better about the intrinsic value of these unique gemstones. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I'd love to share stories with you as to where these beautiful gems actually come from and also why sometimes the prices of these pieces fetch such incredibly high numbers. In my opinion, nobody tells that story enough. When you go in jewelry stores in every capital of the world, nobody really tells you why it is that these pieces are so unique. And I think that happens to make these pieces so incredibly juicy and special. So I hope that through these gem tales, you start to discover or possibly rediscover the beauty of these rare gemstones and that you won't only see them as mere luxury, but also for what they truly are. In my opinion, something absolutely marvelous and also possibly something to be enjoyed in your life. Now, let's dive into the ruby or rat naraj, as it has been called in Sanskrit. I don't know if that was right, Sanskrit, the pronunciation of it, but in any case, it means the king of gems. Now, you may remember that last week I told you about um, the fact that rubies can command the highest per carat price of any gemstone out there. This makes them the most, one of the most important color gemstones in the market. And besides the fact that they are so incredibly rare, I gave you the example of this sunrise ruby, more than 25 carat stone that had been sold in 2015 for over $30 million, absolutely crazy, which means it netted approximately $1.19 million per carat. No colorless diamond has ever fetched that price. Just let me repeat that. No white diamond has ever fetched that price. So I hope it puts a little bit more into perspective your ideas of how rare diamonds are and how actually, in fact, rare rubies are. And we also talked last week where the word ruby actually comes from. It comes from the Latin word ruber, which basically meant red. And that is important because a lot of the red gemstones, all of them in fact, before let's say the 1700s, 1800s, were actually called ruby. So no matter whether it was a red garnet or a red spinel, a beautiful other gemstone, they would all be called rubies. This is interesting to know because still today there are certain trade names that are being used with the word ruby in it that are actually no real rubies. So I thought let's quickly give you that list so if ever you encounter these stones on the market you have been warned and you know that these are not actually rubies. So I'll just briefly go through these. The words to be aware of are alabandine ruby which is actually a misleading name for an almondine garnet, a red variety of garnet. You also have stones like the American ruby, not a ruby. It is actually a pyrop or almondine garnet found in Arizona and New Mexico. There is the Bohemian ruby, another red garnet variety from the Czech Republic. There is the Brazilian ruby, a red or pink topaz from Brazil. Brazil happens to have a lot of topaz, so they obviously use a word, or traders at times may use this word to market their goods 
by using the word ruby and thereby asking a higher price while it isn't a ruby there is a californian ruby that i came across which is actually a hazanite garnet which is a very nice orangey type of garnet there is the rocky mountains ruby love that one which is a pirate garnet so another red variety of garnet and the last one i came across is the siberian ruby which actually is a pink to red tourmaline that comes from the ural mountains in russia so you see, be careful when you come across these words, they are not actual rubies. Now, in that list, I left out the most famous misnomer of all, the stone which has been called the great ruby imposter, namely the Balas ruby, also known as, perhaps you have an idea, another beautiful red gemstone, the red spinel. So I'm going to show you a beautiful photo of a historic piece, a necklace with red spinels and natural pearls. And um, while I explain a little bit more about this beautiful stone. Now, as said before, anything red that was basically found before, let's say roughly 1800, was called a ruby. That was simply because they did not yet have the gemological tools to be able to distinguish between different gemstone species and varieties. It was only in 1783 that this French mineralogist, and now I'm going to stumble over this name, Jean-Baptiste Louis Rome de Lille, massively long name, was able to distinguish red spinel from ruby. They were in fact two different species. He found out at that time. So what is this spinel? or Balas ruby, as it has been called in history. It has been called Balas ruby after Badakhshan, a historic region consisting of parts of today's Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and a little bit of China. I'll show you a map so you can see a little bit better the region that I'm talking about. And you'll see on the map also one of the most famous mines, the Ku'ilal mines, where some of the most beautiful red spinels in history came from, apparently. But more about that later. Now, let me also show you three of the most famous examples of beautiful historic jewelry with that Balas ruby in it. So this red spinel gemstone of which practically everybody thought it was a ruby for centuries. The first one I'm going to show to you is this magnificent piece. It is the 14th century Black Prince's Crown Ruby. This stone has been set in England's imperial state crown and is displayed here in the Tower of London. A ruby, you think, mm -mm, also a red spinel. And in fact, one of 170 carats, which approximates 34 grams. It is said above another tiny stone, as you can see in the photo, the Cullinan II diamond, also a humongous rock. Now, the name of this particular stone, the Black Princess Ruby, let's put it like that, first appears in the historical records of Moorish Spain in the 14th century as the possession of a certain Abu Said, a Moorish prince of Granada in Spain. Now, through several wars and conquests, this stone eventually ended up with the Black Prince, another name for the Prince of Wales, who received it as payment for a victory in battle. Not bad, right, to get as a payment a little rock. Now, since then, the stone has been in the possession of several English monarchs to finally end up in the stout state crown, which is still worn, if I'm not mistaken, every year by the Queen when she opens up Parliament. Now, the second piece I'm going to show to you is called the Timur Ruby. And this piece is also part of the English crown jewels as one of the greatest heirlooms. Now, this stone also has quite some illustrious provenance as the previous one, going from Mughal emperors. The Mughal emperors were the Muslim emperors, rulers in India and Pakistan, to Persian rulers, and ultimately being acquired by a Maharaja. A Maharaja were the Hindu rulers in India. 
um, by a certain Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1813. Now this stone is a whopping 352.5 carats and was considered actually for a long time to be the largest ruby on the planet. That is until 1851 when it was discovered to be a red spinel and not actually a ruby. Now, when the British annexed the Punjab, the north of India, in 1849, they took possession of this Timur ruby from this last Maharaja, and the East India Company then presented this stone to Queen Victoria as a gift in 1851. I always wonder whether that was before or after they figured out it was actually not a ruby, but a, a red spinel. I mean, I still would have accepted it as a red spittle, it's also such a gorgeous stone, but she might not have been so happy, I don't know. Now, the third one I'm going to show to you is this beautiful crown, which is the Imperial Russian crown, which was first used in a coronation by Catherine the Great in 1762. It survived the Russian Revolution of 1917 and is now on display in um, Moscow at the Kremlin. If ever you make a trip there, you know where to head to. I said before that the Timor ruby was considered to be the largest ruby for a long time, right? That was until this spinel was found and brought to Russia by a Russian envoy to China in the 17th century because this stone is 398.72 carat to be exact. It is almost 80 grams and also you guessed it, a spinel. So the reason why spinel and ruby have been confused for so long is first and foremost, you can guess it, they both have a stunning red color. Perfect top color red in a spinel is called traffic light red. On top of that, ruby and spinel are often found in the same mine as well. Spinel actually crystallizes first and only stops when the magnesium in the immediate surroundings have been exhausted. Just as a side note and a refresher from last time, you may remember corundum, ruby, consists of aluminum oxide with chromium as a trace element, and spinel consists of magnesium aluminum oxide. Now, another reason why they may be confused is that spinel's refractive index is quite similar to that of ruby. And the refractive index basically measures the bending of light when it hits the stone. So when light goes from air into another medium, let's say into a stone, into material, what we measure with the RI, with the refractive index, is the bending of the light. And the one of spinel is quite similar to the one of ruby. Generally, it means the higher the refractive index, the better because the stone will simply have a bigger brilliance and that's what we want, right, as a consumer, as the wearer. Diamond, for instance, has one of the highest refractive indices out there, uh, but ruby and sapphire a few spots below that and spinel also a few spots below that of ruby, but both are still considered to be very high. So they both have very good sparkle and brilliance. So no wonder, no one suspected that there was a difference, right? Until 1783, when that French gentleman discovered a tool with which he could show that spinel was actually a different species than ruby and corundum. Now, there was more bad news, unfortunately, because in 1812, a German gentleman, Friedrich Moos, published a certain skill, which is still used today, to define gemstone's hardness. That is important because hardness indicates a gemstone's resistance to scratches and to abrasion and the daily wear and tear of a stone. So gem dealers and gemologists are always massively aware of that number. And as a side note, good to remember for you, best, the best stones to be worn in a ring are those which have a high hardness of seven or higher. The skill goes from one to 10. 10, of course, is a diamond the hardest material on earth. One is, for instance, um, chalk powder. You know, the, this white thing that you use to write on the blackboard? That's one, you can pulverize it among, between your fingers. 
Corundum, ruby and sapphire have hardness 9, and Spinel, they discovered, had hardness 8. That is really, really very high still for gemstones, let me stress that. For that reason, it also belongs to the high-end gemstones out there, but not if you were a person or a consumer or a client who thought it, would be, it was a, uh, a ruby. Then I can understand you may be a little bit disappointed when you figure out it's actually another stone. On top of that, in Europe at that time, the high hardness associated with stones like diamonds and corundum contributed to an increase in the perceived value of certain stones, of these stones. Now, spinels continued to be used until the 1800s and early 1900s, but when people realized it wasn't really a ruby, it became a class B gem, unfortunately. Everyone had been fooled, even the royals. We can see the proof lying in the Tower of London. Now, just kidding, because it was, and still is today, one of the finest colored gemstones out there, belonging um, to the top, together with ruby and blue sapphire and diamond. All of them have their pros and cons and uh, instruction manual, so to speak. So that brought me to the end of this gem tale. In the next one, I will tell you more about this spinel stone and what makes it exactly so exquisite that you should keep it on your radar. Please don't forget to like or follow me uh, here or also on Instagram at Eva Gems and Jewels. You can also check out my website at evagemsandjewels.com. And if you'd like to know more about red gemstones in general, please check out at the link below in the text where I added my red gems list for you to further discover other beautiful red stones for now. And for now, thanks a lot for watching and see you next time.